Amen. We're in a series right now that probably is one of my favorite subjects to talk about, one of my favorite teachings uh, to share with you. And we have titled this series, Burn the White Flag. So everybody say, Burn the White Flag. <laughs> and really, very simply, what we're doing is just talking about being a people who just absolutely refuse to give up. We absolutely refuse to quit. And that is the kind of people that God wants us to be. And the whole image of the white flag you get throughout history, uh, it's been a symbol of defeat. It always signifies surrender. And anytime you were waving it, it meant that you were giving up. And I've told you this, and I just want to remind you of it, that no army ever goes into battle with a white flag in their possession. What that tells you is there are no plans to surrender. There are no plans to give up. Amen? That's just not an option. And it's amazing how much different our lives will be, how much different the turnout of our circumstances will be when we just make up our mind that quitting is not an option. What made me think about this is we were having lunch with a young couple yesterday, and I loved hearing this come from a young couple who've just been married for a few months now because I don't know that that age group uh, always thinks like this, especially in, when it comes to marriage. Marriage is a thing of convenience, and if it doesn't work, and it just doesn't work, and you move on uh, to the next person or whatever. And the young lady uh, said, you know, we, when we were talking about getting married, the one statement I made to my husband now is that divorce is not an option. Everybody say divorce is not an option. And this is not a message against being divorced. I just loved that comment because here's what my wife and I will tell you, and here's what I said to them, is this. You know what? When divorce is not an option, when that's not on the table as a consideration, it's amazing how much effort and energy you'll put into working out circumstances because you don't want to be miserable. Isn't that right? Uh, you don't want to be unhappy. Uh, you want to live a good life. You want to have a great marriage. And so you'll figure out how to get along and how to make things work. And you'll attend the XO conference whenever it comes around every year. Anyway, stick that in there right now, huh? So uh, we shouldn't be a people who consider quitting. And uh, it just shouldn't be an option that's on the table for us. And so God, as God's people, we shouldn't be carrying around a white flag in our possession either. And I just thought about, you know, why in the world would we ever give up anyway because of so many things, but things like the fact that God is for us. God's not against us. He's for us. God is on our side. And if God is for you, who can be, what can be against you? Isn't that right? And, and the Bible says that he's always working on our behalf, causing all things to work together for our good. So he's for me. He's always working on my behalf, even when it doesn't look like he is, uh, even when I may not even always like what he's doing, because very often what he's doing is something in me, and I'd rather him be working on somebody else or my circumstances. But yet, how many know working on you is usually a big part of the equation in turning your world around and making things right? Amen? It also says that he gives us grace and strength. We need to endure the hardships, the difficulties that we are going through while we're going through them, uh, until we get to the other side, his grace is sufficient for us. And then it says that we are more than conquerors through him. We are more than conquerors. We can overcome, we can rise above anything that life or our adversary brings against us. And yet, we have a huge part to play in this. We have to conquer the things that are opposing us, don't we? And we have to refuse to surrender to the circumstances that are before us. And we have to make up our minds. We're not going to give up. We're not going to quit. We are not going to wave the white flag. And we're going to stay in the fight. We're going to stay in the fight. Everybody say, stay in the fight. That's what my message is all about today. It's about staying in the fight. Whether you realize it or not, the Bible talks a whole lot about fighting. And uh, I know that we don't always think of that because we think about the Bible being a book about love, loving one another, loving God, and uh, God loving us, all that. And uh, that's so very true. It is a book about God's love. But on the other hand, and uh, right on the other side, it is also a book about conflict and battle. And it's amazing how many conflicts, battles are talked about throughout God's Word. And I'm not going to 
talk to you about all those because I'm sure you can just imagine, uh, you know, and, and remember, uh, you know, just how much there is that's referenced in the Bible when it's talking about uh, God's people going into battle and, and uh, going into conflict. And from Genesis chapter 3, I, when Adam and Eve first fall into sin, the battle is on. And we're told that Satan is going to be put underfoot. And uh, we are defeating our enemies. And we are conquering giants. Think about all of the stories in the Old Testament. And so in life, there are just simply battles that are going to have to be fought. We have to come, overcome the issues uh, from our past whenever we first get saved, if we're going to enjoy the life that God wants us to live. I mean, we're saved, we're on our way to heaven, but we still got stuff. Come on, amen? How I many know you got stuff? And it's your stuff that's causing you a lot of problems in your life, and so you got to overcome that. And then you got to, you got to fight to build a great marriage and to keep it on course any way we do. I mean, it's it doesn't, just, it doesn't just flow. I wish it did. But, uh, man, there's a lot of times, you know, there's, there's battles that have to be fought. We used to fight each other, and uh, that's the wrong fight. That's the wrong battle to be in. I mean, no, we want to make sure we're fighting the right adversary. We're, and, you know, here's the thing. Again, I just, I really feel like God is going to speak directly to some of you today right where you're at. And we just come out of the marriage conference, so maybe that's why this is so much on my mind. But I'm just going to tell you, you know, a lot of times, you know, we, we get the wrong focus. We start fighting with one another instead of remembering that it is the devil who is our adversary. And our focus as a couple needs to be on defeating him. Isn't that right? And I want to talk to you about that here in just a moment. But, you know, I know there are guys who are in business here in the church. And uh, they will tell you, man, there is a fight to building a great business and to keeping it on course. I think there's a fight uh, to building a great family. Uh, it just doesn't matter what you're talking about. Any area where you're endeavoring to move forward, you're endeavoring to build something great in your life, you're just going to face conflict. You're going to uh, face challenging times, and there are battles that are going to have to be fought and won. How many of you have ever seen the movie Lone Survivor? Anybody? I absolutely love that movie, and uh, it is a movie about uh, Marcus Luttrell and uh, three other uh, men who were in this Navy SEAL squad that is sent on this mission. And initially, everything is going well, and uh, they're, they're, they're going to be fighting with the Taliban. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, things start going wrong. And when they start going wrong, they go wrong real quickly. Kind of sounds like life to me, you know, kind of sounds like marriage. Boy, it can start off great. But uh, sometimes it don't last real long and things start going wrong, right? And it can start going downhill real quickly. Uh, and so I don't know how many of you know the story, but they, uh, it, it is four guys against about 200 of the Taliban. And so they are in this fight. I mean, there's gunfire like you wouldn't believe. And uh, they get pushed back on this mountain to the point that they have to jump, uh, you know, and just fall I mean, a long distance down that mountain and rolling, trying to hold onto their weapons and still, you know, uh, shooting back at the enemy. It's, it's just horrible. And uh, there's one part right on the front end where one of the guys with him gets shot. And some of you might remember this part of the movie. And he yells over to Marcus the trail and he says, I've been hit. I've been shot. I'm, I'm, I'm wounded. And I absolutely love uh, Marcus Luttrell's response to him, he says, can you still fight? Everybody say, can you still fight? Can you still fight? And, and, he's, and the guy says, yes, I can, I can still fight. And he, and he says, well, then get in the fight. Stay in the fight. Come on. And see, I think sometimes we get a little wounded, we get a little hurt in life, and we just let it take us out of the fight. And man, we got to learn we might be hurt, we might be wounded, but we still got to stay in the fight because our adversary isn't going to give up and everybody else isn't going to be fighting our battles for us sometimes. We got to fight. We got to stay in the fight until we win. Isn't that right? And uh, so, again, it's four against so many and they uh, had, to, had to stay in the fight. We have to have that attitude if we're going to succeed in life. And I have to tell myself this often. You got to stay in the fight, Archie. Whether it's in our marriage, you'd think after 44 years that our marriage would just, you know, flow. Everything just be good all the time. But can I tell you, it doesn't. There are still those times whenever my wife decides she's going to be difficult. And uh, 
You know, so you just, I got to remind myself, hey, Archie, stay in the fight. Can you imagine pastoring the church and just, you know, all of the many challenges that you might face? Sometimes they're not great. Sometimes they can be, uh, you know, um, pretty great, pretty significant. And you just get where you just think, ah, I'm just, I don't want to do this. I didn't, I'm just tired, you know, or maybe I even get hurt uh, in the battle, you know, somewhat. And so I think, you know, I, you start feeling sorry for yourself. And then I have to remind myself, you got to stay in the fight. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to stay in the fight. Amen. When I think about people who knew uh, something about staying in the fight, I think about the apostle Paul. And I want you to listen to what he says about what he has gone through what in his life in order to do what God's called him to do and live the life that God wants him to live. And then I want you to think about it uh, in comparison to what you're going through right now. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29, he says, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I've worked much harder than they have, in other words, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely. You, you've been flogged lately? Uh, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews, supposed to be you know, religious people here, supposed to be, we're supposed to be in this together, the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. That's got to hurt. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled, and I've gone often without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I'm faced daily with the pressure of my concern for all the ch churches. Who is weak? And do I not feel weak? Who is led into sin? And do I not burn inwardly? In other words, I'm as tempted as the next person uh, to give place to sin in my life. Think about everything that he uh, says he's gone through there. And then again, in comparison to what you're going through right now, sometimes we are just too quick to start feeling sorry for ourselves and too quick to give up. Amen? And I go back to, I think it was my first message in the series, and I, you know, I just said, we just, we've got to make up our minds. We're going to toughen up, buttercup. Amen? And uh, we're just not going to be such big babies and so immature when everything is not going our way because uh, many, they just simply stop fighting. And when you stop fighting, uh, you become lunch for the enemy, whether you realize it or not. So here's three points that I want to give you just as quickly as I can in the time that I have left. And they are so very simple. But anyway, first of all, there are many battles. There are many battles that are going to have to be fought and won in your life if you're going to experience the abundant life. They're just going to be many battles. I think sometimes we think we get saved and everything's going to be good now. Uh, I thought, you know, I get saved and all my problems would be solved. How many of you got saved and you found out that all your problems weren't solved? And, uh, you know, the problem of your sins was solved. The problem of where you're going to spend eternity is solved. But the truth is you still got a whole lot of stuff in your life and you got to bring Jesus into all of those circumstances. And you've, you've got to overcome everything that is opposing you. In Joshua chapter one, and I'm reading some kind of lengthy passages. It just works out that way. But Joshua chapter one, verses one through seven, Joshua is about to take over uh, leading the nation of Israel. And he's t filling some pretty big shoes. He's filling the shoes of Moses, who's been this great leader. And yet they have not entered the promised land up to this point. And 40 years have passed, as you know, where uh, they have, uh, because of their unbelief and said, we are not able, uh, they had to wander 40 more years in the wilderness and an entire generation die off. And now it is time for them to go in and possess the promised land. And Moses dies and Joshua is the one who's going to take them into the promised land. And here's what it says. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, 
the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aide, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River. Remember that phrase. I saw something I've never seen uh, that I want to talk to you about with regard to that. Get ready to cross the River Jordan into the land that I'm about to give them to the Israelites. And so essentially, uh, God is telling Joshua here, you're the man. You're the one who is going to lead these people into battle. And in doing so, enable them to go in and possess the land. And can I tell you, that would be the word of the Lord to all of us today. You're the, you're the man. In your life, you're the man. You're the woman that God is going to use to not only take you, uh, but to take others in your world with you into the good things that God has for them in life. Think about that. That takes it out of the realm of just whether I want to do this or not for my sake. I realize that every decision I make and the life that I decide to live and whether I decide to give up or whether I decide to push on isn't just going to impact me. It's going to impact my wife. It's going to impact my family. It's going to impact this church. We need to ask ourselves, who is my decision? Who are my decisions going to impact? So he says this, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. So there's the promise. I'm going to give you every place you set your feet. Your, feet. your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all of the high tight country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. And so these are just huge boundaries that he says, uh, you know, is, is, is describing that is going to be land for their, them uh, to possess. Uh, no one will be able to stand against you all of the days of your life. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that's God's promise to you and I of his presence always going with us and his ability always available to work on our behalf. And then he says, be strong and courageous because you're going to lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. And so that's Joshua's responsibility. You've got to be strong and you've got to be courageous if you're going to go in and possess this land. So I thought about this, and, it, and God actually tells Joshua to be strong and courageous three different times. And if God says something once, you know, he's making a point. But if he says something three times, uh, man, he's really trying to make sure you get the point and, uh, you know, make you aware of you go, you're going to really need this. And so why is it that God would tell Joshua three times you got to be strong and courageous? Well, the reason is, is because... Once they cross over the River Jordan into the promised land that they now have to possess, Joshua and the children of Israel are going to face 31 different kingdoms that are ruled by 31 different strong kings, and they're going to have to face those kingdoms, face those kings, and they're going to have to conquer them if they're going to go in and possess the land. Amen? Amen. Now, I don't know how many kings you're going to face. I don't know how many kingdoms there are in your life that are not of God, kingdoms being strongholds that are in your life by virtue of your past and so forth, things that maybe the enemy could use against you in your life. I don't know how many of those there are in your life. I, I know there's a lot more in my life than I thought there were going to be. But I will tell you this, if you're going to go in and possess the land, you're going to have to conquer every one of those kings. And at whatever point you decide, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to face this issue. I'm not going to address this kingdom. I'm not going to, you know, uh, overcome this kingdom. Then that's where you miss out on some dimension of the abundant life. Can you see that? Because the, the promised land is a type and shadow of our abundant life. I've heard people say the promised land is a type of heaven. That cannot be because in heaven there are no giants. There, are no, there is no adversary. There are no problems. So it's not a type of heaven. It's a type of the abundant life. And just as there were uh, adversaries in that kingdom that had to be overcome, there are adversaries, there are issues in our life that have to be overcome if we're going to go and possess the land. I thought about how it says, uh, get ready to cross over uh, the Jordan into the land. And, you know, I've never thought about this, but, you know, crossing over the Jordan all that did was get them into the land. It didn't cause them to possess the land. It just got them into the land. And I, I've never thought about this before, but that really is just a type of salvation. We 
received Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior, and how many know we cross over from death to life, and now we are into the abundant life. It's there. It's ours for the taking, but there are all kinds of adversaries that we're going to have to do battle with if we're going to go in and possess the land fully and completely in our life. Amen? And possessing the promised land wasn't going to be an easy task. They were going to face uh, people who lived behind walled cities. Remember Jericho? Huge walls. They were going to face giants. Uh, They're referred to as the children of Anak. They were just huge people. And there were going to be setbacks along the way. Uh, The Bible is just so, so real. I mean, it's just so down to earth and just practical the way it works out. Do you remember whenever they first get over, they get over into the land and they are going to conquer a city and they are told not to take any of the spoils from the city that they're to devote. It's the first city, Jericho, and they're to, to give it all back to God. It's really a type of the tithe. It's a type of the first fruit. The first belongs to the Lord. And do you remember what happens there? The Bible tells us that, uh, I believe his name was Ai, wasn't it? Uh, anyway, a guy... Uh, kept some of the stuff. He kept some of the gold and silver and he hid it. And so they went into battle, the next battle, and man, they were, they were defeated horribly. And the reason they were defeated horribly is because this guy had disobeyed God and he had kept back some of what God said to give. Are, are y'all tracking with me? And I just thought about how, you know, they weren't expecting that. They had no idea that this guy had done that. And here they go up to battle thinking they're going to win, and they get, come on, how many of you have ever, if God is for us, who can be against us? And then you get whooped. Yeah. Amen? And sometimes you're whooped by virtue of something you've done, you know, some stupid something you've done. But sometimes other people are involved in our lives in such a way that uh, sometimes it's stuff they do that causes us to suffer a defeat. Now, here's the thing. It don't make no difference who did it. It ain't going to do any good to play the blame game. Come on, you just got to deal with the issue. Come on, and rise above the setback. Isn't that right? And that's exactly what they they had to do. So they were going to be tempted to become disheartened and discouraged and to give up. And uh, so they were going to have to be strong and courageous. And you can see that. So that's all so very, very true for all of us. We've got to be strong and courageous if we're going to Always rise to the occasion in our life and address what needs to be addressed. Uh, You know, we might have a great victory today, but I will assure you there is another battle to be fought. And if you're going to keep moving forward and entering into all that God has for you, you just have to keep fighting the battle. Somebody says, well, will they ever be over? Will this time of fighting ever be over? Yes, it will be when you die. (laughs) Not until. Amen? Amen. And uh, when you get to heaven, there are no more battles because there, there won't be no devil. I remember I heard a woman one t- time say, I'll be so glad when I get to heaven, I'll have authority over the devil there. I mean, no, oh, there won't be no devil there. So it won't be, won't be doing you no good to have authority there. We got authority right now, amen? We're to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy right now, amen? So that's point one. Number two, Faith and patience are the two essential ingredients, two essential qualities that you've got to have if you're going to stay in the fight. You've got to have faith. Everybody say, you've got to have faith. I mean, think about it. If you don't have faith, you're probably not even going to get in the fight. But if you don't have faith, if you kind of lose faith, which people sometimes do, then you're not going to stay in the fight. You've got to have faith. And the Bible talks so much about the importance of faith. It tells us that uh, people get what God has promised by having faith. That's what Romans chapter 4 verse 16 says out of the easy to read version of the Bible. People get what God has promised by having faith. How do I get what God's got for me? Do I work for it? No, you just simply have to have faith. And that's what makes it available to all of us. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to be good enough to earn it. If we did, many of us had never received God's promise. But we just receive it on the basis of our faith. Amen? Someone says, well, I just don't have any faith. Well, that's not a huge problem either because Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you don't have any faith, I hear people say that sometimes. Start reading your Bible. Come to church on a more regular basis. Listen to good Bible-based faith-producing, come on, teaching 
that inspires you, encourages you, challenges you. Listen, you ought to walk out with more faith every time you walk out of this building. But if this is the only time you're building your faith, you're going to be in a little bit of trouble. Amen? Man, sometimes I struggle during the week with stuff. Get a little down, a little discouraged. What do you do? I go listen to a good faith-building podcast from somebody else other than me to get my faith stirred. Amen? Yeah, to build my faith. I love the fact that, you know, faith isn't just about believing. It's also about acting. Faith without works is dead. And so when we really have faith, you can tell the difference. It's because it gets you up and moving. It gets you up and moving towards the promise of God. But here's the thing also. You need to realize that faith isn't some kind of, oh, kind of laid back, I believe I receive, and I'm moving toward the promise of God, and it's just, you know, tip throw to the tulips, everything's going to be good. Faith actually has an attitude. In fact, faith fights. Faith fights. Faith will fight for the promise of God. You show me anybody in the Bible who had faith, I'll show you somebody who would fight for the promise God had given them. They would fight to see the will of God accomplished in some circumstances. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Everybody say, fight the good fight of faith. Anybody ever been in a fight? Duking it out? I have. I was in a lot of fights, but I only remember a few good ones. Come on. Do you know the difference between a good one and a not good one? In a good fight, yeah, it's easy. You all know that. I don't even have to tell you. A good fight's one you win, <laughs> right? You don't get whooped. I had the snot beat out of me a couple of times. I mean bad, just bad. Almost got killed. My dad, anyway, that's another story, got concerned about me one day and said, boy, anyway. So I just got in fights, and it was always with guys a whole lot bigger than me. And got my eyes kicked in, and just it was just bad news. And somebody says, you look back on those, were those good fights? No. <laughs> but I do remember a couple of good ones. I remember whenever I whooped a guy that was bigger than me. Yeah, I mean, he was quite a bit bigger, a lot more muscular. But I'm still to this day convinced the only reason I whooped him is because he was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and I got one good lucky blow in, and he ended up on the hood of a car, just, uh, just out. I thought, Samson, wow, <laughs> don't cut my hair, dude. No, I, I didn't think that very much because I didn't look, go looking for a fight after that. Good fights are fights you win. So when it says fight the good fight of faith, this, this is not a fight, you know, hope you win. Hope you, hope you do okay. No, th- uh, the fight of faith is a good fight because if you, if you have faith and you stay in faith and you stay in the fight, you will eventually win. Now, you may have to go more than one round. See, that's our problem. We just want to go one round. We want to knock out in the first round. Listen, the fact that you have to go more than one round in your dealing with issues in your life, problems in your marriage, your finances, doesn't, it, it's not an indication that you are not strong enough or that you don't have enough faith. The fact that you keep going in those rounds, if anything, may prove to me that you actually have more faith because people of little faith quit. People with strong faith, they stay in there, amen? The only difference, one gives up, one doesn't. So I wish I had stronger faith. Stop quitting. When you quit, the Lord says, oh, you have little faith. When you stay in there, he says, oh, I'm impressed. Great is your faith. So everybody say, I need faith. But you also need perseverance. You you absolutely have to have both. Faith alone isn't enough. It needs the support of perseverance. And I I just don't think we've heard enough teaching on this in order to go the distance and to lay hold of God's promises. And I thought about professional boxers. My wife and I watched a movie the other night. It was a good movie. Mark Wahlberg, I think, was in it. And... uh, You know, you can be strong as a professional boxer and you can still end up 
defeated. Because your opponent, he may be as strong as you, and then again, he may not quite be. So you know what the guy who maybe knows he's not quite as strong will do? He will just keep wearing you down, dancing around, come on, punching you round after round, hoping to wear you down so that once he wears you down, he can defeat you. In fact, anybody in here remember Foreman and Ali? Do, how many of you, you're not old enough. You just remember Tyson biting off Holyfield's ear. That's all some of you remember. Some of you don't even remember that. That's a long time ago. But I remember George Foreman saying that when him and Muhammad Ali were fighting over wherever it was, Philippines, and uh, man, George Foreman was a lot stronger than Muhammad Ali. But Muhammad Ali just got in there, danced around, and just, you know, he just wore uh, Foreman out. And somewhere about the seventh or eighth round, wherever it was, he, he looked, in, in, while they're fighting, uh, Ali says, is that all you got? Is that all you got? You know how he was, he's just a mouth. And George Foreman said he thought, yeah, that's about all I got. <laughs> and it was shortly after that that Ali hits him, and, and it's, it's over. Come on. So it's one thing to be strong. It's another thing to have stamina. Okay, faith is your muscle. Faith is your strength. Perseverance is your stamina that keeps you in the fight. And you got to have both if you're going to prevail. Amen? Hebrews 6.12 says that through faith and patience, we inherit the promises. And then if you go on down a few verses, we're given the example of Abraham and it says, and through perseverance, doesn't even mention faith this time, through perseverance, Abraham received the promise of God. Sometimes we think we need more faith. It, faith really isn't our problem. Can I tell you, I doubt if faith is really a problem for much of anybody, if anyone in this room now. You're in this place. You must know God, love God, have a little bit of knowledge. But you got to have some faith. Your problem isn't that you don't have enough faith. Your problem is that you're not... You don't have enough perseverance. You don't stay in the fight long enough. Hebrews 10, 35 says, don't cast away your faith. Don't give up on your faith. Don't do that. But you have need of patience. You have need of perseverance so that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Listen to what he's saying here. Listen, don't give up on your faith. Keep, keep trusting God. Yeah, hold on to your faith. But you need perseverance right now because perseverance is what will keep you doing what you need to be doing in order to prevail in this area of your life. Listen, my wife and I, in our marriage, it did not turn around overnight. It took years for our marriage to turn around. You can have all the faith in the world. If you can't go the distance, you're done, baby. Amen? And we just kept, was it, did it suck? Yes. I mean that in the Hebrew. <laughs> Hebrew translation, yeah. Was it fun? No. Did we, was it miserable at times? Miserable. Did you ever think about giving up? Daily. I know she had to. Putting up with me had to be horrible. My wife, she has so many wonderful qualities. But man, she just don't quit. We've been through hell and back a few times. And there's been times whenever I, I'm, I would be so down. I can't tell you everything because then you'd know everything. <laughs> and you don't need to know everything about us. But I can remember one time it was bad. And I was just feeling low as low can get. In fact, I, it was the, one of the lowest points in our, in our life. And I'm talking with her about it. And she gets a little bit discouraged, you know, at the moment too. And then all of a sudden she just looks over at me and she says this very, I won't tell you what, it said, what she said because then you kind of know what it was all about. And it's none you. <laughs> and she says this very encouraging thing to me. And when she did, it just lifted me up on the inside. How many know it's so important that you keep yourself encouraged, but you also encourage one another? Amen. 
Listen, you don't need more faith right now. Probably not. You probably don't need more faith. Get you some, but you don't, that's not your issue. You quit too quick. And did you know the devil knows your quitting point? Yeah, he's followed you around all your life. He knows what it takes to get you to quit. Some of you have got a real low threshold for quit. You quit quick. Others takes more. I hear music. <laughs> and it's not sweet, sweet music. But, uh, yeah. Then others have a higher. You know what you got to do? You got to change your quitting point. The way you develop perseverance in your life is you go a little longer. You just keep going a little longer. Amen. My last point, which you're not going to get to hear much of, is there's always going to be reoccurring pressure to quit. Always. Always. No matter how many times you overcome the pressure to quit right now, the, verse, the passage I was going to lose, use is where the devil comes to Jesus in the wilderness and he tempts him after he's uh, been fasting for 40 days and he's hungry. Do you remember, you remember the story? And he tempts him in three different areas. If you're the son of God, command these stones be made bread. If you're the son of God, cast yourself down uh, from here. Uh, if you're the son of God bow down to me, all these kingdoms I'll give you. And there's all those have a meaning behind them. I wish I would have time to talk to you about. And the Bible tells us that each time the enemy tempted him to go a way other than the way God wanted him to go, that's really what this is all about, to just really to give up and to quit at this very weak point in his life. Jesus keeps resisting him and coming back to at him with the word of God. That's how you defeat the devil. You come back at him with the promise of God. God is, here's what the word says. I'm going with the word. I'm not quitting. I'm going with the word. And then in verse 13 of Luke chapter four, it says, and the devil left him for a better opportunity. The devil left him for a more opportune time. So the enemy's going to tempt you to quit. You're going to hang in there. You're not going to quit, but he's going to come around looking for a more opportune time. Now, the thing with Jesus was, even though he kept coming back, he never found that opportunity. Amen. How many of you want to be like Jesus and you want to make sure no matter how many times he comes around, he just don't find an open door. He didn't find an opportunity. Amen. Yeah. Did you get anything out of this today? Yeah. I cannot think of a message that is more important for anyone to hear, no matter where you're at in your life. If there's something there that you're wanting to see happen, change you're wanting to experience, blessing you're wanting to enjoy, a different life, a different way of life, a different, uh, your life at a better place, than just to tell you to stay the course, stay in the fight, don't give up, amen, don't quit. Some of you came in here today and you're about to quit. And you came, you've heard the right message. My, here's my encouragement to you. Number one, don't quit. You can make it. Everybody say, I can make it. Everybody say, I can do this. Through him who strengthens me, I can do this. We can overcome this. Amen.